we have recently crossed the center point of the book of Proverbs. And what was the verse that is found in the very physical center of this book of Proverbs? It was Proverbs 16, verse... No, it was not Proverbs 16, verse 16. It was Proverbs 16, verse 17, which reads, The highway of the upright turns aside from evil. Whoever guards his way preserves his life. And that's why last week we saw that those who have the wisdom of God have their lives preserved now and forever. And this theme is carried out into our passage this evening. God is the giver and preserver of life, both physically and spiritually. And again, what threatens life? Sin. It brings death. It kills from Genesis to Revelation, that's all that sin has ever done. It has killed. And that is because the father of sin seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. And so sin destroys. On the other hand, wisdom came to us that we may have life and have it abundantly. John 10.10 10. The wisdom of God is concerned for us. The wisdom of God is concerned for our life because God's way is a way of life. Now, where is sin? Is sin out there in the ether? Is it hanging out in the world? Is sin in the people around us? Well, of course it is, yes. But remember, our biggest problem is the sin in us. This morning in our service, we were going through the children's catechism, and question 38 was, are you also then born in a state of sin and misery? And the answer was, yeah, that's right. Yes, I too was born a sinner and stand guilty before a holy God. And I cannot avoid God's curse by my own deeds. We're helpless because we are born as sinner or sinners and we all stand guilty as it stands before a holy God. So our biggest problem is not just sin in general or the sin in the world or the sin in people around us, but our own sin, which kills. Now Jesus Christ is the fountain of life and He is the sin bearer. He is the death defeater. He deals with our sin problem at the cross in the way he, he takes the sins of all of His elect people and He carries them at the cross and He dies as if He were us. We are deserving of that death. He is our substitute. And for all of our sins, the wrath of God is poured upon Him and He satisfies it and He, he turns away the wrath of God from us and He makes a way for us to be accepted by God by, by granting us His righteous life so that those who trust in Him are not only forgiven of their sins, paid for by Jesus, but are counted as righteous, declared righteous. But between now, believer, and the day Christ glorifies you, you continue to wrestle with and struggle with sin. Next, only next to Satan himself, you remain your own biggest hindrance to a life that is lived to the fullest in and for Christ. I don't know if you uh, have ever seen that Christian Scooby-Doo meme. You know, in Scooby-Doo, in the end, they always find out who the bad guy was. He's usually wearing a mask. And this, um, this Scooby-Doo meme has you know, the good guy saying, let's find out who is behind all of my giving into temptations and my sinfulness. And he takes off the mask and it's himself. It was his own face. Because at, that, at the end of the day, we are the problem. We are often our own greatest enemy. Who, who is the one that's actually causing the problems in our life? Well, more often than not, it's us. We've got the sin. We can blame other people's sin. For example, when we have outbursts of anger, we can blame, so it's because you pushed my buttons. It's because you put me in this circumstance. It's because you said this. You, rose your, you, you raised your voice first, so that's why I started raising my voice. 
We blame circumstance, we blame what other people do, but the thing about our own sin is that other people can't actually just create sin in us. All that really happens is that people and circumstances press us and it brings to the surface what was already there, indwelling sin. It's our own problem. But what separates us from the rest of the world is that we have the Spirit of God. God dwells in us, and slowly but surely the Spirit is sanctifying us, enabling us to kill sin. You probably know that famous quote from Dr. John Owen's book, The Mortification of Sin. Be killing sin, or it will be killing you. And this is the message that the Lord would have for us from the end of Proverbs 16 going into 17 tonight. Of the many conquests we will undertake in this life, one of the most painstaking, yet spiritually fruitful, will be conquering our own self. What we have here in our passage is wisdom for self-mastery. Self-mastery is essentially self-control. It is governing yourself, self-governance. It is ruling your own passions, ruling your character, ruling your responses to life's circumstances. Wisdom calls us to self-mastery. You know, when people talk about um, you know, time management in life. I really want some principles. I need to learn time management. I've tried this program. I've tried these steps. Why is it that I still can't manage my time? Well, because it's not actually time that you are failing to manage because time is just time. That's just 24 hours in a day. and You can't really do anything about it. You can't really change it. You can't chop up time. You can't add or subtract time to a 24-hour day. It's not really time that you're failing to manage. It's the self that you're failing to manage. It's self-management that you are struggling with. Self-mastery. And wisdom calls us to self-mastery. Why? Once again, wisdom is a life preserver. If we do not learn to master ourselves, we will be mastered by another, sin. Sin dampens our senses. It dampens our ability to live and enjoy the life which God has for us. Later in Proverbs 25 verse 28, it says, A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. That's how vulnerable a man is when he does not have self-control. So I want us to think about the requirements of self-mastery. And then after that, I want us to look at the road to self-mastery. There are some basic requirements for self-mastery. If one wants to master his or herself, we need experiential wisdom, we need courage, and we need to trust in the Lord. So firstly, experiential wisdom, verse 31 of Proverbs 16. Gray hair is a crown of glory. It is gained in a righteous life. There are many who are conscious about their gray hairs. Some dye their hair black because they don't want people to know that they're aged. Some, because they're going on in age, have gray hairs. And if they were a man, maybe they'll shave it all off. And when a man is clean shaven, sometimes it's harder to know, how old is this guy? Is he in the 40s, 50s, 30s? Sometimes, especially in today's culture, um, there, there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of attempts to stay young. We're into anti-aging. We're even trying to reverse aging. Now, this verse connects our passage with the previous one. Um, In particular, we read back in verse 25 that there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. So we're reminded of the path of foolishness, the way of life of those who are wise in their own eyes. They claim to be free. They have liberty, but really they're in bondage to sin. And the path they have taken only leads to destruction, to death. In contrast, The one who goes the way of wisdom shall live, yes, physically, 
but even more importantly, spiritually. The, the days of their life shall be prolonged in the land. Let's, let's explain this whole physical and spiritual dynamic. For example, Proverbs calls children to obey their parents, just as the New Testament does. And when you go to the Old Covenant, there's this interesting promise. Honor your father and mother. Paul even says it's the first commandment with a promise, right? Yeah. So that you shall live long in the land. We've discussed this before, but I just want to reiterate it. Under the Old Covenant, there was a very real sense under that law that obedience to the law causes physical life and flourishing. There are certain sins under the Old Covenant that if you're not careful, your life will literally be cut short. You will be killed. You will be excommunicated in a physical sense. You will be put on death row. In the same way, the way the Old Covenant worked was that as we obeyed the statutes of God, there was life, there was flourishing, the land was fruitful, and so on. But of course, all of this points to something much greater. What good is it to live 80, 90, 100, and 110 fun years on earth if you will just after that face the judgment of God and spend an eternity under his wrath. So obviously there is something about a prolonged life here that points us to greater things. The kind of prolonged life that is not only many, many, many years, but is eternal. The life that the righteous have in God. And so the, the symbol, the example that's used here to teach us about this spiritual reality, and I love it, is gray hair. The crown of glory is gray hair. Have you got any? I've noticed some on myself. Got a little mini crown. It's a crown, a badge of honor. It's a sign of great achievement. And in this passage, how is it attained? A righteous Life. The righteous shall live long, and life is so precious. While people today are trying to stop and even reverse aging, we want to age. We want to live. We know it is good to live. In the ancient days, and in many cultures still today, it is, it is, it is highly looked upon to be aged. It is highly looked upon to be wise in years, and it is usually associated to actually being wise. Well, those anti-aging products and procedures do not actually guarantee a long and fulfilling life. But wisdom does. And that's why we read back in verse 16 once again. How much better to get wisdom than gold. To get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. All the world's, world's riches cannot add a single day to your life on earth. But wisdom not only preserves your life today, but forevermore. Wisdom will not only, not only has the capacity to pro prolong one's life on earth, even practically speaking, because you won't do dumb things, right? That'll get yourself unnecessarily killed, but then of course you've got the sovereign hand of God. He has ordained all the days of your life. But wisdom is even greater than that because it is able to grant prolonged, everlasting life in communion with God. So this idea of growing old and gray is a symbol of something greater. It's that prolonged, more than that, never-ending life, eternal life, that we are able to have in Jesus Christ. Back in Proverbs 12, 28, in the path of righteousness is life. And in its pathway, there is no death. And how do we find ourselves on this path of righteousness? Well, by believing in the righteous Son of God who has walked His path before us. The prophets say that this Messiah, the, 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 the crucified and resurrected Messiah, he shall prolong his days and he shall see his offspring. The prophet says. Now, prolong his days. Jesus died at a young age of 30-something. See his offspring. 
He never got married and had children. What is that all about? Well, Jesus is the true wise one. You, you, you may have a hard time seeing many gray hairs on a 30-plus year old, but he bears the true crown of glory. For he is the one whose days are prolonged, for he is the eternal one who has even conquered death. And what does it mean that he shall see his offspring? He brings many people who become children of God into the household of God, the family of God. And as we'll see later on in verse 17, verse 6, the glory of children is their, their fathers. The Lord Jesus Christ, the righteous Son of God, walked the path of wisdom before us. And now as those declared righteous, as God's children, thanks to Jesus, we are being called to make use of wisdom to preserve this precious life that we've been given and live it to the fullest. For that we need more than just statements of truth. We need truth set on fire. And that's why we're saying we need experiential wisdom. We need the sanctified wisdom of righteous saints who have also followed Christ and walked the path of life before us in the church. We need to gravitate towards those with gray hairs. And not only people with physical gray hairs, but those with gray hairs in the faith. Those who are matured and seasoned in the faith. Spiritually seasoned. We need to gravitate towards them and expect the kind of wisdom we need to learn to master ourselves. If you are a dear older saint, I hope that people would come to you and say, Brother, sister, I'm struggling with this besetting sin. Have you ever dealt with this before? Well, I tell you, the one who is willing to go to such people, you will often find out there's nothing new under the sun. You should ask them, how did you overcome it? Can you give me some counsel? Younger Christians, do you have Christian parents? All the more, Proverbs 1, 8 and 9, hear, 8 and 9, hear my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. I, I find it interesting and also encouraging when I have conversations with, with people who grew up in Christian homes and who maybe didn't really understand for many years, oh, why do we do this? Why did my parents not let me do these crazy sleepovers? Why was I like this? Well, you know, all of these things, looking at your other friends, and you feel like, oh, I'm overly sheltered and all that. You go through some, some hard times. You, you start to realize, uh, you know, you, start, you, you come to Christ, maybe you're, you know, in your late teens or you're in 20s now, and I have, I've had many conversations where I talk to them about their life and ask them about their parents and how they were raised and everything and how they felt about the seeming strictness of certain Christ Christian ways of parenting. And then after all is said and done, they look back at it and they realize, now I'm glad. N now I'm glad my parents did that. Now I'm glad my parents taught me this kind of wisdom. Now, now I'm glad my parents made it very clear to me that bad company corrupts good morals. Now, now I'm glad my parents taught me how to be what my friends called a prude. And I wasn't just sleeping around, and I was interested in modesty and all these things. You look at the path that the Lord has taken you through the use of even godly Christian parents, and sometimes you don't recognize it until later on. What else have they placed me on but the path of life? Elders in the church are expected to be seasoned Christians, aren't they? And thus, in Hebrews 13, 17, we read, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls, as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So turn to the ones, first of all, turn to Christ, and then turn to His people, especially the ones who are seasoned, who have gray hairs in the faith. We need experiential wisdom, and where there is any lack in our own Christian experience, we must turn to seasoned saints for this kind of wisdom. Next, we need courage. Verse 32 reads, Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. 
What is strength? Now, I know I pick on this friend of mine a lot, but 100 kilogram snatch, personal best before the new year. Wow. 100 ki- snatch, double. Wow. That is some strength. That is admirable. That is desirable. It's, it's, it's a worthy feat to place on your story. But, but do you want to see superior strength? Do you want to see supreme strength? A man who is slow to anger. According to Proverbs, that kind of man is better than the mighty. It's better than the, than the mighty men of renown. Be- better than the strong men who take over cities. Real strength looks like a man who rules over his passions. A man who rules his spirit is more powerful than a man who can seize an entire city. Oh, to govern oneself, what a courageous feat. Brethren, do we not realize that the vast majority of problems you will face tomorrow will be your own fault? It takes courage to admit that. It takes bravery to admit that and to deal with it head on. It takes courage to be humble. Humility, after all, is not weakness, is it? It's meekness, which means strength under control. But let's not think that the secret to self-mastery is just courageous willpower and getting some good advice from some gray-haired seasoned Christians. The last thing that is a requirement for self-mastery is trust in the Lord. But we're not going to stop saying this throughout Proverbs. Trust in the Lord and lean not in your own understanding. You can get all your spiritual disciplines in a row. You can surround yourself with the best Christian mentors. You know, that, that happens sometimes. There are Christians that are just like, they're kind of like obsessed with mentorship. Now, we're all into mentorship. You need mentorship. Get some mentorship. We all need some coaching and mentorship. You know, if you want to use coaching, I don't want to use coaching. If you want to use that, you know, but there's just, you know, some people that that's their whole thing. Their secret to the Christian life is it's not being part of a faithful local church. It's not, it's not faithful observance of the means of grace. It's, it's not these things. Their secret is, I've got these three mentors. You probably know one of them. He's famous. That guy, he wrote three books. He mentors me. And that is an immediate badge of honor that, oh, the, the, the principle of you know, such and such is mentoring him. He's got to be solid. He's got to be a solid guy. And you know, all you know, all that happens in their mentorship se- session is just the, the guy telling him, like, what is wrong with you? What are, you know, that's what their mentorship session is all about. That's, I'm meeting with you because you messed up, you know? And it's okay to be honest about that. But know this, verse 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. The outcome of events, everything that happens in our life is by the sovereign hand of God. Our business, therefore, is not to act like we're sovereign over our circumstances, just order things around us right, but to rule our spirit, to govern ourselves, to have mastery over how we respond to whatever it is that God sovereignly brings our way. And we will learn, we will only learn, How to respond in a godly manner when we trust in the sovereign Lord. You see, if you don't understand God's sovereignty, then you're going to to try to be in control. And sometimes you'll feel that you're a victim of circumstance when you can't take control. None of this was planned. Uh, None of this needed to happen. It's just a series of unfortunate events. There is no good hand behind this at all. It's all horrible happenstance. And before you know it, For lack of a better term, you go into I hate my life mode. But if you embrace the sovereignty of God, you will understand that not a single thing happens to you without God's guiding hand of providence being behind it. And that ought to help you understand with self-control. For we have no control over providence, over God's sovereign decrees, 
over all things which come to pass, but we are real volitional creatures. We do have exercise over our own self. You'll respond in a way that is governed by a, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good kind of mindset. And with that mindset, you will have the right priorities, and you will even have contentment. Chapter 17, verse 1, Better is a dry morsel with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. You will reap many benefits and blessings when you trust in the Lord. Verse 2, A servant who deals wisely will rule over a son who acts shamefully and will share in the inheritance as one of the brothers. Silver and gold can be bought, but wisdom is the family inheritance of God's children. Verse 3, the crucible is for silver, and the furnace is for gold, and the Lord tests hearts. When you trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding, He will test you. He will refine you and discipline you, and sometimes this testing will hurt. But as Proverbs 3 has said, my son... Do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of His reproof, for the Lord reproves him whom He loves, and as a father, the son in whom He delights. So these are the requirements for self-mastery. We, we need experiential wisdom and courage, but most of all, we need to trust in the Lord. Remember, when it comes to the beginning of the Christian life, salvation is of the Lord. We trust not in ourselves, but in the person and work of Christ. Trust in Him alone for our salvation. And salvation encompasses our whole life of sanctification as well. It is a life to be lived in constant trust in the Lord. So then, finally, what is the road to self-mastery? What do we actually do? Well, Proverbs always makes it easy to spot what it shouldn't be. To spot the wrong Foolish road, verse 4, an evil doer listens to wicked lips, yeah, don't do that. And a liar gives ear to a mischievous tongue, yeah, don't do that, I get that. We're not supposed to do that, that's the foolish way. This is the antithesis to experiential wisdom or to seeking the counsel of seasoned saints. Instead of wisdom, he, he's listening to wickedness and foolishness. Instead of listening to seasoned saints, he would rather listen to to wicked lips and a mischievous tongue. Proverbs also gives clear warnings for those who go down this road. Verse 5, Whoever mocks the poor insults his maker. He who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. A New Testament echoes this theme in Romans 8 verse 13, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. How do we live according to the Spirit? How do we walk and go up the road of self-mastery? Well, Hebrews 12.2 tells us that we need to be looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So here's the first thing you need to do if you want to be on the road to self-mastery. Look no further than the Master Himself. This is an interesting thing to consider. True self-mastery is not actually in its strictest sense self-mastery, but is actually being mastered by another. Instead of sin, instead of my flesh, instead of my own selfish will, the Master Jesus Christ. Jesus, who exemplified self-control. Remember when Peter drew his sword against one of the soldiers who were trying to arrest Jesus? Remember what happened, what our Lord said to him in Matthew 26? He said, put your sword back into its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father? And He will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? Jesus was truly man. 
He had passions like us. But because he was without sin, he subdued his passions. Do you get what he's saying here? This is real self-control. He is saying he could have called 72,000 angels from heaven down to the Garden of Gethsemane to obliterate the opposition. But the will of the Father, the plan of redemption, the fulfillment of Scripture was way more important than unleashing his fury. In that moment, in Christ, we find both a perfect example and one who is able to master us. That is why Romans 13, 14 exhorts us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So guys, we are actually unable to master ourselves. We lack the wisdom that is needed. We aren't courageous enough to humble ourselves to the truth. And we constantly fail to trust in the Lord. But we say it again, Christ is wisdom unto us. Christ is most courageous of all. So courageous that He humbled Himself in the form of a servant and submitted Himself to death on the cross where He faced and suffered the wrath of Almighty God. That courage and humility. Christ never ceased to trust in the Lord. Not long before the soldiers came to arrest Him, this is what, hap- what was happening just before that in the Garden of Gethsemane. My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as You will. That is trust in the Lord. This is the master that we need. A master who is our savior. A master who is a humble servant and who laid down his life for us. A master who no longer, would no longer have the anger of God come our way. He would take it away by satisfying his wrath against our sin. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. And thus the many who are waiting for a messianic revolutionary who will bring about political reformation looked upon Christ and saw His meekness, His humility, His constant trust in the Father, His prioritization of the gospel. And many of these Jews who were looking for a a mighty and strong political revolutionary, they were thinking to themselves, where is the strong man? Who is this guy? And yet, according to God's wisdom, the one who appeared before them was the strongest of them all. He was the true mighty one. For he is the man who is slow to anger, better than the mighty, and who rules his spirit, mightier and stronger than the one who takes an entire city. John Owen, in his book, Mortification of Sin, gives us two general rules for putting our sins to death. Now, read the book. It's filled with convicting material about how we need to make use of the many graces given to us by God to kill sin or else have it trample all over us. But this is interesting. The first general rule he gives is this. Be sure to get an interest in Christ. Be sure to get an interest in Christ. He writes, quote, Unless a man is a believer, he cannot mortify a single sin. Do you hear that? Mortification is the work of faith and the unique work of faith. Close quote. So you can be disciplined and hardworking, but without being united to the Master and Savior Jesus Christ by faith, you are powerless to master yourself. And so, in one sense, you are being called right now to stop trying, it's so similar to this morning, to stop trying to just muster up all the strength and skill and ability to master yourself, and you need to come to a point of ceasing and coming to the Master, and by faith trust in Him who can master you. The second general rule that Owen gives is this. Strive to mortify, if it gets practical, strive to mortify all lusts or fail to mortify any lust. What is he saying? He's saying, quote, this kind of selective mortification is the result of a corrupt motive. You know what he's saying there? 
it is very often an expression and act of self-righteousness and pride to have our hobby horse sins because it seems by appearance that we have so well overcome these sins and other people are doing a really bad job about it. So all you do is rave about how that sin is so despicable, that sin is so bad, it's so horrible. You put all your emphasis, all your power, all your focus upon those specific sins because it's coming from a place of pride. I'm not struggling with it, but they are all the while forgetting the many sins, the many sins that you are still struggling with, that you are failing to put to death. And potentially the only reason why you're putting so much emphasis in this one sin or in this one group of sins is because you know you have a firm, found, you have a firm footing because you're in a place where there's currently a little bit of victory over it. And you would be crushed to have the realities of your many hidden sins exposed to others. Strive to mortify all lusts or fail to mortify any lusts. Again, this kind of selective mortification is the result of a corrupt motive. But for the struggling Christian who is fighting against sin, but still has lots of persistent sins that they are struggling with, Owen writes, quote, God may be using the persistent list that troubles you to strengthen you. Almost like a thorn in your flesh. Many people have you know, come, come, to, come to others for counsel saying, I, I had victory over this sin for so many years. It, it was never, it, it no longer was a desire at all. It wouldn't even slip my mind. It wouldn't even go through my thought process. I was certain that I would never commit those atrocious sins again. I'm done with that life. And, and they ask, why did it come back? Why has it returned? Why has it stuck to me once again? Well, sometimes, well, of course, it's our own fault. God is not to blame. We are. But sometimes in His, pro- His providence, He allows these besetting sins in His divine plan to remind us, my child, do not become overconfident. D- do not think that you are so victorious over a certain sin that you now just move on and you never have to worry about it again or mortify it or fight against it because you're victorious now and you just go on your merry way. Sin is sin. It's, it's there. It dwells. There needs to be a constant mortification and sometimes it's actually a very kind and gracious thing for God to allow these besetting sins to come to the surface. We think, oh, it's scandalous. Now people know about it. I feel so ashamed and guilty and embarrassed. I've had two or three people address this with me now. Oh no, am I in the disciplinary process now? That was like two or three witnesses, was it? What's the next step? I'm really struggling with this. Is this bad? Count it as a grace from heaven above, that this in His providence would be brought to the surface. Because in God's divine genius, He probably knows that for you, my dear child, if it were not brought to the surface in this way, you would make no effort to mortify it. And He knows the power of the many witnesses, of the loving rebukes and corrections of your brothers and sisters, and of even coming to the point of recognizing how shameful Our sin is. God allows these things because He loves you. Because He wants you to recognize sin for what it is. Because only when you recognize it for what it is will you seek to put it to death. God may be using the persistent list of sins in your life that troubles you to strengthen you. I want to conclude with the last verse of our passage here in verse 6 of chapter 17. Children are the crown of the aged. And the glory of children is their fathers. Uh, George Schwab, who has written a very nice theological commentary on Proverbs, comments on this verse, quote, The glory of a person is in how they join the path of wisdom that stretches back in time to creation 
and in how in their own time they propagate the tradition to generations to come. That's the whole grandchildren and children glory theme. This is a death transcending dimension that includes the life hereafter promised to the wise. Jesus who shared the divine glory with his father from eternity, John 17, 5, and who in John's vision is the personification of glory, Revelation 1, now enjoys in full measure all of the promises made to the wise. And so he continues, this glory, the glory, the crown of glory, all of this that is talked about, is accessible to all who embrace the life of wisdom, not shunning the discipline of God, but submitting to Him as Father. So look to the Master Jesus Christ for help and rely on the, here's the last thing, sanctifying ministry of the Holy Spirit. We have no greater helper than the triune God. So I conclude with a quotation from Scripture, right directly from Romans 8, verses 10 to 11. May this be a concluding remark fitting for all of us who seek to be mastered by the Lord Jesus. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and dear believer, He does, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. You are alive. Keep living in Christ. Make use of that wisdom that your life may be preserved, lived to the fullest, and enjoyed and give yourself over to Christ and His Word and His Spirit so that He would have mastery over your life and that you might begin to resemble the mightiest one, the one who can rule His very own self, our Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank You for sending to us one who is more powerful than anybody in this world who is both mighty and strong and humble and meek. Thank you, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, for walking the path of wisdom, because if we did it ourselves, we would never succeed. Thank you that you have attained for us all the promises in the book of Proverbs that have been made to the wise, especially true prolonged life, and everlasting communion with Yahweh. Thank you for bringing us into this life and this communion by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray now, keep us, preserve us, remain in us as we remain in you. And may your wisdom be manifested in our life in the way we walk the path of life you've prepared for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.